All right, are you ready to hear the word? Oh, you sound so enthusiastic this morning. Are you ready to hear the word? All right, I like it, I like it. Matthew chapter 13. We're going to be reading the first nine verses, and then we'll read verses 18 through 23. While you're finding that, uh, I do want to encourage you to be a part of that community service on the 30th at the Union Church. I don't want to be the only one who burns up. Actually, uh, I asked my friend here to, uh, when he called me to see if I would preach on the 30th, I said, I will on one condition. And he said, what's that? And I said, that you put a fan up there in the pulpit. And I meant it too. And you're going to do it, aren't you? Yeah. Even if you have to buy some extension cords, right? (laughs) Okay. As hot as it is. In that church, you know, at the end of July, as hot as the people are in the pews, you know, that is a very elevated pulpit. And he goes up, you know, it gets real hot up there. But no, it'll be a fun time and it'll be one of the shortest sermons you'll ever hear me preach. (laughs) So come and let's have a good time together. (laughs) All right, Matthew chapter 13, first nine verses that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore then he told them many things in parables saying a farmer went out to sow his seed as he was scattering the seed some fell along the path And the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Then verses 18 through 23. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the words and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Thus ends the reading of our gospel. Let us pray. O oh God, in these next few minutes, a lot will be said. The most important thing that is heard would be your word. Speak a word tailor-made for each person listening. 
Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. We didn't read this morning. In Isaiah chapter 55, which is the Old Testament lectionary reading for today. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Then the psalmist says in Psalm 65, The grasslands of the wilderness overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks. And the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. And the epistle reading for today comes from Romans 8, which begins, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. What a stunning, joyful claim, if there ever was one. And then our gospel in Matthew that we read a moment ago says that the sower went out to sow. Jesus told this large crowd as he sat in a boat and as he uh, saw many multitudes of people on the shore. The sower went out to sow and the seeds he flung all over the place in joyful abandon brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then Jesus says, let anyone with ears hear. Well, now, I don't know about you, but if you're anything like me, anxious about um, uh, these record-breaking heat days, uh, all the flooding, if you are weary about all the, ugly, the ugliness that is infecting our politics, and if you are heartbroken or furious or maybe both in the face of systemic injustice and inequality and violence and death, then you need some joy. Boy, do we ever need some joy today. So what I want to do is, I want us to press in and see where joy resides in these sacred texts that I read just a moment ago. According to these passages, what makes for delight? What makes for pleasure? What makes for pure, unqualified joy? Well, as I read these carefully, I noticed something. I noticed the deep and persistent connection between joy and lavishness. Between joy and plenitude. Between joy and indiscriminate generosity. Now, dare I push the, the connection any further? I noticed when while reading these, the link between joy and abandon. Between joy and and wastefulness. That's right. Isaiah describes a God who pours rain and snow down from heaven without measure. Those poor people in Vermont know that well. God bless their souls. They're going to make it though. I know those people. That used to be my getaway. I know a lot of people up in Vermont and they're tough. They're going to be all live, huh? 
But Isaiah describes a God who pours rain and snow down from heaven without measure, watering everything on earth in the full confidence that what needs to grow will grow. God says, so shall my word that goes from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty. But it shall accomplish that for which I purpose. It will succeed in the thing for which I sent it. And the psalmist, listen to this, he writes of overflowing pastures, of years crowned with bounty, rivers full of water, and wagon tracks that overflow with richness. Oh, I love these texts. And Paul in Romans makes no qualifications to his thundering claim of God's free gift of salvation. There is no condemnation because he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you, Paul said. But now, for me, it's this gospel text in Matthew 13 that makes the most compelling case for divine extravagance and its relationship to joy. You've got Jesus sitting in that boat, looking out at the crowd on the beach, and he tells them a story. He tells them a parable. The sower goes out to sow, and some of the seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some of the seed fell on rocky ground, and they sprang up quickly, but they withered because the sun scorched their shallow roots. Some of the seed fell among the thorns and were choked, and yet some fell on good ground and brought forth abundant grain. Now, I don't know, is your experience the same as mine through the years? We focus exclu exclusively on the four types of terrain, the four types of soil. You know, through the years, I, I think about my people, I think about you as I preach to you from week to week and worry over who is hardened and who is rocky and who is thorny and who is good. We agonize over how to find and cultivate more fertile soil in the church. Or we read this parable and we walk away from it feeling bad about ourselves, feeling bad about our faith life feeling judged, inadequate, anxious, wondering how you can make your soil less hard, less rocky, less thorny. You know, we have this way of designing all kinds of self-improvement uh, projects to fix what is wrong with us. You know, more prayer, less Twitter, more Bible study, less criticism, more church, less television. You know, we plan and we prune and I want to tell you something. There's nothing wrong with self-assessment. It can be very good. But I'm afraid that we miss the crucial lesson here when we read this parable as the four soils. 
This is the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower. It's, it's about the nature and the character of God. Of God's kingdom. Of God's provision. Of God's extravagant generosity when it comes to us, His beloved creatures. I want you to consider now the actions of the sower. He sows everywhere. I mean everywhere. I mean, I want you to imagine this sower walking through the fields, walking through the meadows, walking through the back alleys and the sidewalks and the playgrounds and the parking lots of life, fistfuls of seed in his quick-to-open hands. He doesn't sort it. He doesn't save it. It just spills over. It falls through his fingers. It covers the whole ground. It's, he scatters seed everywhere, in every direction. And the surprising part of this story is, he doesn't mind. He doesn't mind a bit. That there's, this, there's this confident realism in him a sense that what needs to flourish will flourish. Not all at once, and, not, and maybe not everywhere, but that's okay. This sower is unconcerned about where the seed falls, or lands, or settles. He just sows. He just keeps on sowing because there's enough to go around. There's enough to accomplish his purposes. There is enough to waste. You know, are you like me when you read this? Do you wonder about your own contrasting stinginess the truth is we just don't believe that there's enough good news to go around we just don't have confidence we don't have confidence that God's word will accomplish what God purposes no matter where it lands we, we just don't trust God's endless ability to soften hard ground, to clear away rocks, to cut away through the stubborn thorns, to make room for harvest. And we don't care about the birds as much as God does. I forget, do you, that all of the terrain is finally God's, under God's provision and sustained by God's love. Who am I? Who am I to tell God what good soil looks like? Who am I to decide who is worthy and who is not of the sower's generosity? Who am I to hoard what I have been freely and generously given? Who am I to look at God's profligate blessing and call it waste? Who am I? Who am I to do that? Oh, oh, if only our failures were the opposite of what they've been in relationship to this parable. I tell you how I wish that the church across the ages, across the cultures, across denominations and circumstances 
were known for its absurd generosity. How I wish that we were famous for being like the sower, going out in joy, scattering seed before and behind in the wildest arcs our arms can make. How I wish the world would laugh at our lavishness rather than weep in the wake of our stinginess. How I wish people could see a quiet, gentle confidence in us when we tend to the hard and the rocky and the thorny places in our communities instead of finding us abrasive, judgmental, exacting, and insular. How I wish, how I wish the seeds of love and mercy and humility and justice and honor and truthfulness would fall through our fingers in appalling quantities. Somebody say amen. amen. Is this your wish too? Yes, that, that, that all of this fall through our fingers in, in unbelievable amounts. That even birds and rocks and thorns and the shallow sun-scorched corners of our world would burst forth in colorful, riotous, joyful life. Oh. What does the world need more than a sower who is lavish? Who, who always errs on the side of wastefulness? Who would rather... This sower would rather lose a bunch of seeds to inhospitable terrain than to hold back a single one. You know, at, at some deep, intuitive place, we recognize wisdom here. We know that Jesus is telling us the truth. And we know, don't we? I know Mike knows this, that seeds are mysterious. You know, you, we know that the most elegant and carefully cultivated garden can fail. Whereas a profusion of weedy, vibrant flowers can push through the cracks of pavement and beautify the neighborhood. New life can spring forth from the deadest, most shriveled places of our lives. Places we've given up on. Places that we assumed were hardened beyond hope. I tell you, we've witnessed, have we not? inhospitable environments being altered by love. We know that joy follows selflessness and generosity, not caution and miserliness. In the end, in the end, the problem is not our ignorance, in the face of this gospel, the problem lies in our unwillingness to follow in the steps of this extravagant sower. 
his carefree generosity bugs us. It worries us. His seeming wastefulness offends us. Why won't he be discriminate? Why won't he wait and withhold just a little bit? Why won't he privilege, privilege the terrain that's most deserving? Because that's not the kind of sower that he is. That's why. Look at him. Tossing all that seed to the wind with a, a daring, delightful smile on his face. Inviting us to toss our handfuls of seed across the earth everywhere and share in his joy. The question is... Will we? Will we? Well, Amen.